Hi, this is Jim Campanini, the author of the Wine Novice blog. You can find it at lowellsun.com. And we're here at Ricardo's Trattoria on Gorham Street in Lowell. Today we're going to get some pointers on how you open a bottle of wine, how you serve wine from Ricardo's uh, main bartender, Dennis Meadows. And he's also helps Dickie Rourke in selecting some of the fine wines that you find here in this restaurant and uh, also at Tutto Bene. So Dennis has a great palate and uh, his boss puts them to good use. So Dennis, you've got a, an array of glasses here. Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell our audience first why the different glasses? I think uh, for the most part uh, people would consider red wines, for instance, to be in bigger glasses. And that, that is accurate. Champagne, for instance, would be in a smaller glass where the bubbles would go up slower. You hold the carbonation and essentially you, you're enjoying the last sips of the champagne just like the first. But most restaurants really have a standard glass pour. Mm -hmm. And this would be what we would consider a standard glass. Now this would be fine for white wines, rosés, and red wines. What about the person at home who's uh, entertaining guests I mean, they, they don't have a big budget to go out sure. and get all these kinds of uh, glasses. Should, should they have a, a one or two uh, different kind? Of yeah, I would, would uh, advise having uh, a set of two or maybe even four glasses that you might take out on uh, special occasions or if you're having a, a better than average bottle of wine and you want to enjoy it. There are a lot of crystal glasses out there that mm -hmm. are a little expensive, but uh, they're worth the money. They do make the wine more enjoyable, the whole experience more enjoyable. Uh, for the most part though, if you're entertaining, you want to have, some, like I showed before, a nice standard glass, something that could cross between someone enjoying white and then they want to move on to red. Very good. Okay, you have a bottle of wine here. I what do. You, what, what is the proper way to, to not only open a bottle of wine, but say you wanted to impress the people at home. Okay. Um, everyone's probably accustomed to opening bottles of wine at the house, and there's a variety of different kind of wine openers to use uh, and different presentations to go through. Uh, there are people that will go out to a restaurant and they'll notice that there are a few different things that the server or sommelier or wine steward might go through, and I can show you a couple of those right now. Okay, let's see that. Now, most people that work in the restaurant business will have what's called a waiter's corkscrew. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very small, easy to hold, and essentially this covers all the bases as far as opening a bottle of wine. Can you just hold that up for, yeah, the, please. for the camera? Yeah, That's it right there. Okay. So and you can buy that basically at uh, any wine shop? Sure. Or? You can find this at wine shops. Uh, we have the tendency to wear these out pretty quickly in the restaurant <laughs> business, so we have more than one. We keep more than one. What do they cost? About less than uh, 20 bucks? Cheap as chips. Let's say maybe a couple bucks for one of these. Okay. And this is really, you can keep it in your drawer at home, it's very easy. Now what it has is a blade, mm -hmm. and the blade itself is what you initially will use to get the capsule off the top of the wine. The reason why there's a capsule is because it will protect the cork underneath it from anything from moisture to a variety of different things that could affect what is actually inside the bottle. And so you need to cut this off. Now there's a couple different lips here, for the most part just hold it with your thumb Mm. And this is what somebody in a restaurant will do after presenting the label to the customer who's about to purchase this bottle of wine, and we'll score. Okay, very simple. The top of it. This is, in itself is really nothing that needs simple. to be seen anymore. Well, that looks good. That was smooth. Well, open a few bottles. Yeah. Now for the so most. So a little practice. A little very, practice. And even it, I can do that. Everyone can do All this. Right. It's very very simple. Now, with the worm of the corkscrew itself, has a obviously a, a pointed end, and you need to initially sink in on the cork. So this would be something to sink in like this, and then turn very, very easily. Simple enough. You gotta get to a certain point where you're right about there. Now this is essentially a hinge. So you want this to do all the work. You see a lot of times when people are opening up bottles of wines, they're, they're pulling, pulling and pulling that, almost that, in a comical we way. We want to avoid that. Right. This is a hinge, and this hinge is going to stay right on top of there. So if everything is sunk down correctly, you line that up and just let the lever do the work. This happens to be a model where it has two hinges because some corks, whether they're from California, a lot of times from Europe, are longer. So you would need this extra little lever to push the wine out, and I'll just do that right there. So it's two steps, easy. Nice That's and easy. easy. Now in a restaurant, they may show you this 
pork. Is that really necessary nowadays? It's, it's necessary in a way where you might want to feel it in your hand to see if any of it, uh, any of the wine has seeped through it. The notion that you can learn anything about the wine by sniffing it is a little bit outdated, I think. Mm -hmm. But you really want to make sure that while this wine was being stored, it was uh, protected from heat, it was protected from cold, air did not get in and ruin the wine. But you're initially going to find all those things out with your very first taste. And that would be it. Now in a restaurant or at your house if you're entertaining, you have your bottle open. Sometimes you may open the bottle a little earlier before your guests arrive. That's entirely up to you and that's where you would use decanters and things like that. But initially you want to give a sip of wine to maybe one of your guests or if you were in a restaurant. So swirl that a little, swirl it around, around, get it yeah, yeah. Mm, Now, nice. when you first open a bottle of wine, I'd say nine times out of That's ten. That's why I love this job. <laughs> nine times out of ten, uh, you'll know immediately if the wine has uh, unfortunately been spoiled or what they say in the business of being corked. Yes. Yeah. Right? And that's something that you shouldn't feel bad about sending back in a restaurant or if you're with uh, guests at your house, turn it into sangria or cook with it. Okay. And you can still use it that way. Now, have you ever sent back a bottle of wine in your, in your career? At the have, have I personally as a customer? Mm -hmm. I have. And, it's, and, and it seems like a very uh, intimidating thing for mm -hmm. you to talk to a server or a manager and you know basically say that you don't think the wine is good. You should never send back a bottle of wine because you don't like the taste of it. You've purchased the wine. If they deceived you in any way saying this is going to be very, very dry and ends up being very, very sweet, for instance, well that's not exactly what you signed in on. Mm -hmm. But that whole process of tasting is to make sure that essentially the grapes, the juice, everything in the bottle is fine. And it, sometimes it isn't. It travels a long way from Italy. Or yeah. well, from France to get here, so things can happen along the way. Very good. Now, you did mention something about uh, decanting. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a certain um, uh, a tips or basic tips when you should decant and when you don't have to worry about it? Yeah. Or more with reds, do you decant white wines? Uh, um, uh, I would say it's probably more with reds. I've, I've heard of whites being decanted, but the, there's two essential reasons why you decant red wine, or, or in this case, maybe import wine. And that is a natural thing that happens sometimes with wine called sediment. Now, a lot of wineries uh, do not go through a process of over filtering and over um, uh, taking away the essence of the wine through filtering and straining. So you might have, especially with an older bottle, what would be called sediment. And that's that little last sip of wine you have where there's a a uh, little bit of a, a chunkiness to it. Mm -hmm. almost a, 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 And there's nothing wrong with that. There's sediment. actually nothing wrong with it, but the decanting will leave that, leave that out of the wine. Those things don't harm the wine, but those last couple sips you're enjoying, you might get a little on your tongue, you might have purple lips, but it's really not that bad. That's one reason you want to you get that out. So you would strain the wine into a decanter, leaving the sediment at the bottom of the bottle. The other reason you might want to decant a red wine is because these wines have been made to store and to sit down and to cellar for a very long time. Now, if you were to open it up and immediately jump right into it, the wine will be nice, but it won't really have that full effect. You need that oxygen. You need the spinning of the wine, putting it in another container, a nice clean container, so that that wine will open up. So those first sips will taste just the way the winemaker planned for it to be. Very good. I've done that with some, uh, uh, mostly with some uh, uh, older wines. Mm -hmm. and, uh, sure. And uh, I, I don't think I have to do it much with the younger, although I did have one over the weekend that mm -hmm. was tasted a little green. Right. It was good, but it was, you know, it wasn't fully, it, it, fully developed. And to, be honest, and to be honest with you, the majority of wines that you're going to find in the stores nowadays, red wines will say, are meant for immediate consumption. Mm -hmm. These wines will store for a little bit, for a couple of years here and there, but they're meant for restaurants to use them immediately. They're meant for people to enjoy them at the house immediately. The other thing I would always suggest, and, and if you ever get a chance to grab one or two of these big glasses, these are nice. They're fun for entertaining. Everyone mm -hmm. really feels like you get something in your hand. But this essentially is a decanter on a stem. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, if you had an older Cabernet and you feel that it would benefit from decanting, well, just use a couple of these glasses where you would pour it and you're essentially Oh, yeah. aerating it out. So as you're talking at a table, I have the tendency to always do this. I sometimes drive people a little bit crazy, but as I'm talking, I'm always like this. You're essentially decanting the wine 
without the use of a decanter right in the glass. And you set it somewhere. You swirl like a professional. Every time I try to do that, I spill the wine. It, you What's the key to doing that? <laughs> the, the key, I want to learn how to do that. The key to the key to doing it is probably at first do it on a flat table. Mm. Hopefully, uh, you know. This doesn't have a tablecloth on it, it's a little hotter on a tablecloth. But that would be your essential way of doing it. Eventually you're gonna get up to have the confidence to do that, right? But it, I've been at wine tastings where I made the mistake of wearing a really nice white press shirt and the wine has splashed across me. So if you feel- oh, well, Is it in the fingers or the wrists? How are you doing? Maybe a little bit in the hips as well, all three. <laughs> so so uh, essentially that's good. And that, that gives you the opportunity to stick your nose in it, to smell yeah. how the flavors are coming out, and the aromas are coming out. But uh, don't really bring it up to chest level unless you right. feel confident. And, and if you are, maybe use white wine before you use red wine. If in this case, when I was wearing a white shirt, I wish I was tasting some Chardonnay. So. All right, when you buy a, a glass, a bottle of uh, wine at a restaurant, how many glasses should you expect to, to be poured out of that bottle of wine? Well, I mean, the cardinal rule for at the house, and everyone is not really going to get down to an ounce or percentage rise, but you want to have four people enjoy a bottle of wine. So that would, everybody would get a glass, you know, just a little bit more than a glass, glass and a quarter, glass and a half. Um, so if you're planning on having uh, four, two people over for dinner, have at least two bottles of wine. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have the same wine, but if you try the first and you enjoy it, you don't have a backup, then sometimes that might be sad. So you'd get between uh, 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 four to five glasses? Yeah, I'd say more or less. That, I think yeah. that's the, the proper way to do it, about five glasses. So. Very good. Okay. Now, what about you've opened this wine, you, you've shared it with someone, but half of it is still left, you didn't finish it. Yep. What should you do? Is there any difference between a white wine and a red wine, how you store it? Um, yeah, the, the reason, the, the ways that a, a white wine is going to survive a little longer is going to be a little different from the way a red wine is going to last a little bit longer. What keeps a white wine viable and fresh and just the way you want it is sugar. So wines that, uh, white wines that have a, a higher sugar content, which is natural sugar as we're saying, uh, will last longer. Put a cork in them, put them on your refrigerated door, go back to them when you want, and um, you still, you know, can get a couple of days out of them. If you get to the point where you start feeling like it's getting a little flat, that's when we start talking about making white sangria or making shrimp scampi and use the white wine to cook with. Red wines have uh, not really necessarily the sugar, but tannins they're called, and that's really essentially the skins, the, the guts of the wine, the, the, the backbone of the wine is what keeps it together, the structure. And the red wines that have the most tannins and that's that dry, dry taste when you first taste the red wine, the knock in the nose when you first put it back. That will protect the wine as well. Uh, you can still put the, a half drank bottle of red wine in your refrigerator, in the refrigerated door. What I would suggest is if you get home from work, you want to enjoy a glass of wine, take it out as soon as you walk in the house, check your mail, put the keys down, get ready, and then have a glass of wine maybe a half hour later. So you let it, you, you, you let it warm right. up a bit. And where, as we were saying before, how air and oxygen helps bring out some of the qualities of wine when you first open it. Essentially air towards the tail end, the end of the spectrum, are going to hurt the wine because eventually they're going to start getting to the wine and breaking it down. So some people use smaller decanters like this. I have friends that whenever they have a half bottle of wine and they open it up, they save it, send it through the dishwasher so it's nice and clean, and they put a half of a bottle of wine like this into a small bottle of wine, put a cork on it, and then it's ready to go. You want to really keep the air level as, uh, as minimal as possible because that oxygen will essentially start working through the wine to make it not so great. Now, I've seen these, these, uh, uh, these gas pumps mm -hmm. okay, that people use sure. sometimes to, to, to take out the yeah. oxygen. Are those really effective? Um, that they are to a certain degree, but uh, it seems kind of uh, for your average person at your house, it just seems like um, maybe a little bit too much. Yeah, I can understand a restaurant that might have a hundred wines by the glass, where they have made a, an incredible investment of money into making so many different selections of wine. They might want to consider something like that. Mm -hmm. But for your average person at the house, putting this in a smaller bottle, putting it nice and corked on, in your refrigerator or um, not waiting five days to finish a bottle of wine. Right, right. It might be the best way to go. Yeah, okay. So, so let, let's uh, just say a, a shelf life for this bottle of wine, if you drank half of it, you should probably finish it within the week of when you, five days of when you've opened right. it. Right, I, mean, I think it might be harder when people are uh, get, buying bigger bottles, Yeah. where they yeah. buy the, like, the, what would be considered a Magnum or 1.5, 
but essentially if you're talking about a 750 bottle, a standard bottle of wine like this, enjoy it over three or four days. And uh, if, if you can't do that, then uh, you know, keep, keep it cold, keep it in the refrigerator or uh, on the sangria it is. What do you, for, uh, for, for, for here at Ricardo's, uh, how do you uh, serve uh, white wine as opposed to red wine? What temperature? What is the, what is the, the, the best optimum the, temperature, would you say? When we, we're talking about in, in the 50s, we'll say, uh, what they, the way it is done in restaurants is not necessarily typically the way it is. A lot of people feel that white wines in restaurants are served way too cold and that the red wines served in restaurants are way too warm. Mm. And that's basically because of the way the restaurant stores it. And, 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 and what you're trying to do is you're trying to bring a white wine five to 10 degrees lower from your average cellar temperature, which they say is like probably in the 50s. So you want it in like the mid 50s. And that red wine, you want to be just a little bit above that. And uh, that's essentially, when a white wine is too cold, mm. and when it feels like you pulled it out of a freezer, that may be fine if it's a hot summer day, but you cannot really taste some of the qualities of the wine that you want to when it's that cold. You, the you taste freeze them out. Yeah. Yes, I mean, as you get through the wine and it starts coming up the room temperature, then you're gonna say, wow, this, I, I'm noticing something about this white wine I didn't notice before. Uh, red wine, on the other hand, it's okay to have a light chill on a red wine. That's the way I like it. I yeah. don't necessarily think you should put it on the rocks. No. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it would be, if, 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 if it's very warm in your house, you're out, at, out, of, out in, uh, on your patio, for instance, in the summertime, it's not the end of the world to take a bottle of red wine, just put it in your cooler for 15 minutes. Just mm. bring it slightly down and then enjoy it. Good. All right, last question. All right. Okay. You go to a restaurant, and, and uh, some of these restaurants have uh, sommeliers, mm -hmm. okay? What is, uh, what can you tell the, the viewing audience uh, to, uh, uh, how can they judge a good sommelier? Because it, it could be anybody, sure. especially for someone like the wine novice, who really doesn't know much about wines. How do you protect yourself knowing that you're getting good advice? Uh, all these people usually pretty good at what they do. Um, and, and they are, they are. I mean, they, they do have to go through quite some training. Um, are there any good questions we should ask? Well, when I mean, you might want you might want to uh, consider telling a sommelier, a wine steward, what you're having for dinner. Now, there are so many cardinal rules they make with wine that you can only have white wine with fish and this and that. And some of those are true, but a good sommelier, a good wine steward, will match essentially the the weight or the the, the style of food. If you're having a heavy, big steak, then they're going to match it with a wine that essentially will hold up to the steak. You could have a wonderful, wonderful Pinot Noir and spend a good amount of money on it, but if you have a big ribeye, that ribeye is going to erase that Pinot Noir. Hmm. So you've spent a substantial amount of money and uh, you're not really getting the full effect. So you, I think a good sommelier is flexible, flexible to the customer's needs. If a customer really likes sweet wine with steaks, I would find a really nice sweet white wine that hmm. would go with steak. I don't personally, would it would be my choice maybe at the house. No. But as long as you're making the customer happy, and a good wine steward, a good sommelier, always has the customer in mind first, and they'll find a way to make them happy. Very good. Well, Dennis, thank you very much well, for your advice, you. and good luck. Good this luck is Jim Campanini, the wine novice. Be back here next week. Thank you.